Hi everybody, I'm Jenny Fergus. I'm back with episode three of Beauty and Perfection. And I'm working on a commission painting of a beautiful 100 year old farmhouse from Virginia. And today I will be proceeding ahead with lots of paintings. So I've repositioned the camera. I hope you'll be able to see a little bit better and won't be upside down. So here we go. Okay, um, here's how far I've gotten. And um, as I mentioned before, I don't do any preliminary drawing when I paint. So it takes a, a while, the, the first shapes are the most important as far as positioning and placement and size. So I have done that. I've got the roof shape as one big shape. I've started on some of the lighter colors so they'll be clear and bright flowers. And here's the little smokehouse. Uh, I'm going to proceed now with a lot of the um, foliage. And I wanted to say in watercolor, you may know, in, in classic watercolor painting, the white in a painting is really unpainted paper. So it's uh, not like you go back in and paint a white house on top of everything else. Wherever you see white here, particularly the house, it will be clear, unpainted paper and the way the shape of the house comes together will be by the foliage that um, comes right up next to it in the painting or in the landscape. And my friend had a list of the colors that she wanted for her flowers and other foliage around the house. And one of those items was a rosy pink azalea right up next to the house and so I'm using here this is a little alizarin crimson with some permanent rose mixed in I like to blend colors before I put them on the paper and I also do a lot of mixing with wet and wet painting and on my actual painting on the paper but in the palette that's a mix so let's see these azaleas are not in bloom in the painting but i am imagining that they are up near the bottom of the house here so if i'm looking here which is this spot in the in my painting the foliage is here kind of come along and I think that there are going to be some azaleas here and maybe kind of over here. So if I look as a reference point, the second pediment here is where there will be some azaleas. And I'm going to go in and place some of those in here so they'll have time to set up and dry a little bit as I'm working around in other parts of the painting. So here, again, if I come over, go down, there's probably some more up in here. Now, she also mentioned that she had a flame azalea, which are blooming here in Georgia right now. The people next door have a beautiful one. So I've gotten a good look at it. And as the name indicates, it's a bright orangey yellow flame color and I know that her azalea is the flame azalea is over here so I'm going to go in and put some of that in too and I'm going to change that just a little bit I'm adding a little bit of that pink I used earlier to sort of change this color so it won't be exactly like the irises that I've already put in the painting. And then I'm going to add a couple of little 
spots up here that are more of a yellow color. Okay, now one thing I like to do is while things are wet, is drop some clear water in, push the paint around a little bit. Now these kinds of places do take a lot of time to dry, but it's worth it because later you have a beautiful surface I don't use hair dryer or anything like that. I like to let the paint dry naturally. I think it gives the surface a more beautiful look and it doesn't push the water around and change the paint in ways I'm not happy with. All right, now, another place in the painting that has some of this very similar color are these chimneys. So I think I am going to go in and get those placed. And I'm using color I already have on the palette. That was the Permanent Rose, the Alizarin Crimson, and I believe that that was probably Cad Yellow Light that I added in here. Now this is a little, a little orangey. I'm going to add just a touch 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 of this cobalt blue just to tone it down just to gray it down just a little bit and how that cuts that cuts the brilliance really quickly just a little bit now orange and blue are complementary colors which when placed next to each other like on a football jersey auburn orange and blue they vibrate and call attention to each other. But when you mix complements together, they neutralize one another. So this mix had more orange and just a tiny bit of blue, but it definitely neutralized and toned it down just a little bit. I'm going to add these three chimneys. And again, if you notice, the chimney is just a little bit higher than the roof line there. So I'm going to let that just peek up just a little bit. And the angle up and just a little bit out. Now it's a little heavy on the paint there, a little thick. I'm going to pull that over and make that a little wider too, a little different proportion. But I, I don't like the thickness of the paint, so I'm going to get a thirsty brush, which means a brush that's basically wet, but it has most of the water sucked out of it like this. So when you touch that thirsty brush to a puddle of water, it sucks it up. So there I did it. I'm going to add just a teeny bit of pink into this wet chimney so it doesn't look like a construction paper cutout. Again, I like, uh-oh, boy, I got too much water on it that time. So something like that happens. You know, I may have to suck it all up. And even do a little bit of a blot. Now, when watercolor, you know, people always say you can't correct. Well, that's not really true. There are corrections you can do. But they happen at different stages in the painting. So, if you want to get paint up, the best way to do it is to blot straight down on it. Then you have to let it get bone dry. If you try to go back into it now, it will run and go where you don't want it to go. So I have to be patient with my own error. Okay, we're going to get this little chimney in though. Three chimneys on this house. And it gets really cold in Virginia in the winter. I'm sure these fireplaces have been well used. Okay, let's see. Now where will this one be? So this is this triangle here. 
and there's where the roof intersects. But I, so I have to remember that um, I want the edge of that chimney there. I'm gonna come up with it. So I'm using shapes that have a distinct color like these chimneys, later you'll see with the foliage, to abut the white parts of the house. And where these shapes abut, they define the edge of the white part of the house. So those edges are, are pretty important. You know, you want them to be in the right place. That's not, that's pretty dry. I'm gonna go on back in here with this chimney. We'll see if it dried. Okay, now I'm going to suck some water up out of this one and this one and this one. So every time I touch to get this water out with my thirsty brush, I can touch it to a rag, or I can touch it to a paper towel, or Kleenex, whatever you like to use. And then I'm just going to touch a little pink, and a little pink, and a little pink, to perk those up a little bit. All right, so I've got my chimneys in place. I've got a lot of the colorful flowers. Now, I also know that she has got lavender, she says, next to her front porch. So I think using this, I think the lavender's probably maybe here. That's where I'm going to put it. And I'm going to use cobalt violet, which is one of my very favorite colors. It's a very odd kind of slightly murky violet. And it's a little, it has some opacity to it. It's You still use the watercolor transparently where the light can pass through the paint and bounce back up off that white paper. That's what gives watercolor paintings their luminosity. But some colors have more body or opacity to them than others. Now, cobalt violets are a very distinctive color. I'm gonna use it flat out, straight out right now. And I'll show you what I'll do with it. So here, I'm just going to imagine, let's see, I've got my, this is here, about here. I'm just gonna give some little, just a few little places like that. And then over here, again, imagining that they're peeking out from here. Now, I like to use a variety in color, no matter what. So I'm going to touch this blue. Let's see, I'm gonna add a little bit here. This is manganese blue hue. Manganese blue, one of my faves. They don't make it anymore, the real thing. So that anytime you see a watercolor paint that says hue added to the color name, it means they have created it somehow out of something other than the actual mineral or um, chemical of, or earth that used to be around. So I'm gonna let that just sit. See, I'm letting those colors blend some places and be separate other places. Now, the next step on the painting, um, I do need to put in this little roof over here that I didn't do last time. I'm gonna mix the manganese with that 
pink I made. I like to use colors that are already on my palette. Some of that's just an intuitive sense for me, but if I stop to analyze it, I do know that using colors that you already have in other places on the painting will unify your painting. So that's a nice sort of a gray. And this little roof, it is a grayish blue. It's darker than this roof or this roof. And I'm gonna go in and tuck it in right here. It's, it's smaller too, because it's in the distance. So I've gotta make this the right, kind of a, the right size. Let's see what that angle's doing. It's mm, slightly up, just slightly. So I'll get that in there. And it's sort of peeking behind. And then this came down. I'll go in and just add that. It's peeking, peeking out behind the irises here. Let's see. Oops, no, I don't want to smear anything. Okay. I'm just going to leave that alone. All right, let me look at my list. She wanted azaleas, pink, lavender next to the house, flame azalea, which we've included, Green and white flowers. Now that's not easy to do. Anything like I said earlier, white is paper that's left unpainted. And there's a lot, 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 lot of green in this. So I'm going to think about that closer to time. But right now I'm going to make some green. I'm going to make some green. There are many greens here. Many, many greens. And that can be a very daunting thing, especially if you are a new painter. But they're warm greens, they're cool greens, light greens, dark greens. And there's a lot of green even like here that has some red in it. So I'm going to start by, I am gonna clean this off my palette right now, um, just to give myself a clean place to mix. And I'll probably mix up some different puddles of green. So let's get this nice and fairly clean. Okay. I'm going to use my slightly larger brush to get started. And the first thing I'm going to do is think about the big tree back here that really is behind the house, it frames the house. It starts to create even more, uh, it'll make the house pop forward because the house is so pale compared to the tree. So here is some hooker's green, which I love. A lot of artists don't use hookers, but I do like it. Now it's a real greeny green. I'm not going to put that straight on the painting because it's pretty unnatural looking. Every now and then you see it in nature, but not too much. So then I'm going to touch my green gold. It's a, sort of like an olive green, but it's got more gold in it. It's very, it's got a, a brightness to it. See how pretty it is on the white when I mix it with the hookers. So. I've got a good puddle going here. Now I'm going to start on this tree back here. And you'll notice that I'm thinking of the tree as a big shape or a silhouette is another way to look at it. It also goes into this. This is all one great big shape back here, but this is a lighter area. So is this, there are some spaces where either trunks are showing or the sky is showing through. So I want to be mindful of that and I want to start with a lighter pass of green because I'm going to drop other colors into this while it's still wet or possibly go back over it later with darker passages on certain places. So, 
I'm going to start here. And I want to get up right next to the roof of the house because as I said before, this green shape and all other shapes that actually touch the house define the shape of the house. Now I've got to be super careful here because this chimney is wet. And now if I were not filming this, I would probably be waiting. But for the sake of your patience and mine, I'm going to take a chance here. Okay, and there's like a little divot here. I want to accentuate that. And then this is going to go off the top of the paper. But I'm going to leave some little peep holes. Judicious peep holes. Later, I'll put some sky peeking through in some of those places. Okay. Some of those peep holes can be a lot larger than others. Now up here, it's really very, very golden and pale. There's also some, um, some definite red tones. Let's see here. I'm going to add a little sap green to this mix. Maybe a little, it's warmer than the hookers. Let's see what we've got here. I'm going to pay attention now what I'm doing. Okay. other photo okay there's some big some big peoples here so I'm gonna leave some of those peeping out and they're going kind of okay let's see here I'm gonna make this come around here we are in this shape and it goes down. Now, here's an important spot. Like I told you, here's this white house. Dark background. This is important. You know, I want to use the where the white house meets all this greenery to define the shape of the house. Because I'm not painting the house white. I'm leaving white paper to make the house have its shape. Now this is really dark up in here. I'm going to go back in in a minute. Now there's also this very goldenish tree popping up here and sort of up here. I want to go in and get some of that in because as I said last time, if you want clear, bright colors, you really have to paint those on white paper. It's unlike oil or acrylic painting where you add highlights on top and at the end. Watercolor is a, I guess you could call it a backwards process. You want lighter, if you want something really pale or bright and light, you have to put it in on white paper. Now I'm letting some of that green come through because you know the trees are not construction paper cutouts and that's really pretty. It did it naturally. A very gradual 
um, shift there from the green to the gold. Let's see, now while I've got this going wet, I am gonna touch a little bit of this bright yellow up here. Now I want to remind you that we're making a painting. We're not copying nature. We are responding to what we're seeing. I really like to do it that way. So I, ha I use a lot of artist license to make the painting as pleasing and as beautiful and as interesting and stimulating as I can. Visually stimulating and emotionally stimulating, I hope. That's my goal. Okay, so now we've got kind of a cool looking murky brownish color. And I'm going to go on and drop in some um, trunks. It's a little dark. Lighten that up by adding more water to it. Dilute it is a way to lighten paint in watercolor. The more water, the lighter it'll be. Oh, we have some peeking through. I didn't leave them over here, but I can go back in and have some later. So I've got some of that there. And I'm gonna go on in and about I may add a little of this this is emerald this is emerald green or Veronese green is the other name of it now this is a color I use most of my paint is Winsor Newton artist grade tube paint this color is by Sennelier and you may be familiar with that brand that many of the impressionists use that and you can still go to the Sennelier store in Paris it's Pretty cool to think you are shopping where a really famous artist shopped 150 years ago. Now that's a little strident, I think is a good word for that. But I'm going to see what I can do with it here. Now when you use a color like I have just used in a painting. You're not going to have it just over here. You've got to think, where else can I add this color? What can I do with these colors to lead the eye around the painting? So it may not be right this second, but I will find somewhere else to put that odd green. Plus, I don't want it pulling your eye out of the painting over here on the side. I like it because it's a variety and it gives a little relief from all this green. But I also know it's, it's very strong and it's, um, it pulls your eye over here. Now, I might cover some of that up later too. I see I'm using the Thirsty Brush again. To pull up some of this paint. Okay, and I did. Um, sometimes I like it to bleed. Other times I don't like it bleeding. I think I'm gonna stop that a little bit. That's a little, a little much. So I'll go back in and fix that little spot later. Okay. Now, while this is still wet, it's very wet. So I've got to pay attention to it because at different stages of wetness in a watercolor painting is when you can add colors in. They will move at different levels or different rates dependent on how wet something is. Now, if I want to really lighten up an edge like this, like this, this is a little heavy. I'm going to suck some of that paint up. I'm going to lighten this by wetting it and then removing or sucking up some of the pigment. 
So I've still got some of the same color yellow that I used up here, which is right above the house. It'll cause the viewer to look at the house and accentuates the house. And I want to use it some other spots, but I, I want to be careful how I use it. Okay. I'm going to pull some of that up. All right, now. I'm going to add a few of these little viney like marks on the little smokehouse. Because I left some spots for it. I'm going to go in and put it in there. I'm connecting some of these dots or marks. Now the ones are standalones. I'm going to use that too to help define that roof. I almost forgot that, but I'm going to use it right there. Now, I might touch some of this with water. Touch some. Okay, now this, this is doing nicely, but I'm going to touch some deeper paint. I'm going to add some permanent rose, I think it was, to my hookers. And look at that color. It's kind of a dark, murky, olivey green, but it's darker than olive. It's a nice dark color. And there's some really dark places. Now later, I will use this. I might use a little bit right here right now just to see what will happen. Because this is a really dark area here around the flame azalea. There's also some really dark places up under here that I could just plop in like this in between those trunks. And I like that. Mm. This little place is not doing what I like. I gotta fool with that a little bit. And you don't want to fool with it too much or you can make a big mess. Okay, Let's see if I can just touch that. And I can always go back on that later and touch a, a dark piece of orange there. Hmm. I'm going to have to pay attention to this for a few minutes to, uh, I think I'm going to suck some of that up. I'm going to let that sit like that for a little while. And see, once all that dries, I can go back in, I'll add another layer. I can make adjustments, add in some um, trunks. Okay. One thing I might do before I move from this, though, is just add a little bit just a little bit of that warm green right here. Just to let it blend a little bit. And I might touch just a teeny bit of this yellow in there. There we go. Okay. And I also might touch just a little bit of that really emerald green, that Veronese green. 
I'm going to give it just a touch right here. Now, this is a real compliment to the chimney color. So that really pulls your eye right there. They're right by each other. So they're going to bleed quite a bit. That's nice. So I don't have any place where it's just like, that's the only place I've used that color. Okay. Now, around the house here, I'm gonna pull this a little closer. Let's see. I'm getting ready to come to a stopping point here. I think I've gone long enough for right now. I did want to say one thing from today um, that I was thinking about. Uh, I'll turn it to myself. When I was going to sleep last night, and that is the importance of taking the first step. And I'm very, very familiar with the feeling of not being able to, to move and not being able to take that first step out of fear or lack of confidence that you can do it. And what I have found is every time, if you just make yourself make the first mark, the first step, you will enjoy it and you'll feel so much better and you will succeed. Painting is uh, new every single time. So every time, you approach a new piece, you're going to have probably, like most artists, that feeling like, oh gosh, I've got to do this again. Can I do it again? What am I going to do? What's it going to be? Is it going to be what I hope it'll be? And I have learned through painting now for 37 years um, to trust yourself and learning to trust that you, every time you attempt you will succeed. It may not be exactly what you dreamed of it being or even hoped it to be, but it will probably be more interesting and better in that sense because it'll be new. And going into the unknown and trusting yourself to make those first steps, just one step after the other, each step is new because a painting is really a series of thousands of little choices and little decisions. So every step is a new, a new step. And if you just keep going and push through all that uncertainty, you will have a self revelatory experience that's unlike any other. And it brings joy to yourself and to people who view your work. So take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.